All right, 13th century, the years 1200 to 1300, and I'm going to just focus on Francis. The backstory right now is the Crusades, but we've talked about the Crusades. You've passed a test on the Crusades, haven't you? You got that, so you know about the Crusades, and so I just want to have that in the back of our mind. It's a tumultuous time. It's a time of change, and in some ways it's the change that is being created by this transformative moment in history that gives the context for a guy like Francis of Assisi. I don't know if he looked like that. Somebody there was there with a digital camera and you know, caught that little uh, pose. I'm not sure, but anyway, that's somebody's idea as to what he looked like. He was born in 1181, so just at the tail end of the 12th century, and of course carries us through to the 13th century. I'm going to take his story more or less in two chunks, his beginnings and then the actual uh, start of the Franciscan order. He was born Giovanni, he was Italian, he was born in Assisi, which is in Italia. And uh, so this name Francis is a little bit unexpected, but it was given to him by his father Pietro, who was a cloth merchant and was one of that class of people that was part of the rising middle class in this day. This was a time when because of the trade that was being opened up through the Crusades and connections with the East and a variety of other forces were creating now for the first time in a long time a kind of middle class, not a majority by any means, but a, but a more than a, a tiny minority of people who were beginning to accumulate a certain degree of wealth and the father and mother of Francis were among those people. Pietro gave the nickname to Giovanni of Francis because he loved France and he had some pretty good dealings there, business connections in France and so to kind of honor his respect for the French which were up to the north of Italy, he called his son by the nickname Francis and so that's how we know him but he had no other connections to France except that he toured through there at a later time. Francis did grow up with a bit of a conflicted childhood in this sense. He was in a family that enjoyed some of the better things in life. They were not super wealthy, they weren't nobility exactly, but it was this kind of merchant class that was beginning to gain a certain degree of means and influence, and so Francis was surrounded with some of the better things in life, but at the same time, this was still a moment in history when there was a fair amount of grinding poverty not far from the front door. And Francis was a kid with a certain degree of sort of sensitivity of conscience, I guess you would say, and he felt that even as a youngster. He would realize he was eating pretty good food here and dressing in fairly nice clothing and all he had to do was walk down the street and see folks who were in a vastly different station in life and while he didn't have the wherewithal to know exactly what you do about that, it does seem, as he reflects on it later, that even at that point, he was feeling some of the disconnect. And it, it was a frustration to him. And he was also a little bit disturbed because his father didn't seem overly worried about the problem. His father was doing well in business and was kind of passingly aware of human need out there, but was really much more concerned about succeeding and not really taking much care about any of these people or any of the evident needs. So this, this is at least what Francis describes later as some of what disturbed him in his earliest years. He was nevertheless a very popular kid around town. Assisi, as you may know, is not a real lot. Who's been to Assisi, by the way? I know some have. You've been there, Gordon? And I've been there three times. I love the place. I'd love to go back and live there for six months. It's just a great little town, you know, winding streets. Probably looks a lot like it did. Uh, with, with certain notable exceptions, but uh, the streets the, are very narrow, that kind of thing, a very appealing little town, and that's where Francis grew up, uh, and he was very popular. He was uh, affable, he had a great sense of humor, he was, he was attractive, he was one of those people that you just kind of gravitated to, and so he had that sort of happy upbringing and childhood, and at the same time this little nagging conscientious problem in the back of his mind about people who weren't so well off. But in the year 1201, it was a bit of an important turning point. He's about 20 years old now, and Assisi was in a conflict with a nearby town called Perugia. Uh, 
And this was, of course, during the era of feudalism, and so these towns would get into squabbles with each other over various issues that might come up, and it was expected that young people about France's age would participate in military excursions. And Francis, of course, was uh, willing to do that, and so he participated in this military venture that was going to go from Assisi to Perugia. There was already a siege going on, there was a bit of a squabble happening and a little bit of violence along the way. Francis was not a military man. He wasn't trained necessarily for military arts, but it was expected that he would participate, and his father didn't want to spare any expense, so he got all the, uh, you know, a wonderful horse and all of the accoutrements of being kind of like a knight, you know, and he had him all dressed up and looking good. And there was a bit of a pep rally as Francis was leaving along with some other young men in town, and they were all going off to this heroic and glorious venture of the battle with Perugia, you see. So they sent them off to cheers and all of that. The battle didn't go so well. Francis, as it turns out, was uh, slightly wounded and captured and became a prisoner of war. And so for about a year, just a little less than a year, he was in a prisoner of war uh, kind of camp. And for the first time in his life, he was up close and personal with the kind of experience of poverty that he had only observed from a distance in his earlier years. He talks about how for the first time he really could identify with what it was like to just have barely enough to eat, to be shivering at night in the cold, to be fear, fearing for your very well-being and your survival, to have this kind of sense of upset in your life and have no really safe place to go, no soft place to land in your life. To be a prisoner of war was very much in his mind like being in that state of impoverishment that had troubled him so much in years past. And so it did represent a bit of a turning point in his own understanding of what this whole problem was and how it was going to affect his life. He, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. He uh, was freed about a year later uh, through a prisoner exchange and the payment of some well-placed bribes and that kind of thing, you know. So he came back to Assisi broken in health. He was already, he picked up some diseases and so on. He wasn't feeling all that well, and it took him a while to get back on his feet. But from this point on, you do see a little bit of a different Francis. Uh, before, he had been kind of outgoing, happy-go-lucky, life of the party, people loved him, and so on. But now this conscious conscience concern that he'd had becomes a little bit more evident in his life, and he begins to think more seriously about those who are in his life who are in evident need. And there's several anecdotes that come out of this, and I'm just going to take a moment to say this because I may forget it later, but if you ever happen to come across this little classic, it's written by Johannes Jorgensen. It was, it was published originally about 1910. It's been republished repeatedly down through the years. It's probably still the classic biography, well-researched. This guy traveled to every place Francis visited. He did a lot of research back in the day, and this is still considered the definitive uh, biography, and no, you may not borrow it from me. So there you are, but uh, you may come across it. I picked this up a few years ago for 95 cents. In fact, that's the, that's the published uh, price. I think I actually got it for like 15, 19 cents. I picked this up for 19 cents in a used bookstore. That, my friends, is a bargain, you know. Uh, so if you ever come across this uh, biography of St. Francis, it is well worth your reading. And what you're going to realize if you do read it is I'm not even giving you the tip of the iceberg this morning. Uh, his life is just one wonderful, engaging, inspiring story after another. And so I want you to appreciate that what I'm giving you is just a taste of this very remarkable character. But anyway, some of the stories that come from this era, which is after his experience being a prisoner of war, but before he really started the Franciscan order, uh, this is the kind of time frame, about seven years that we're dealing with here. He's still really officially part of the family. He's still the heir apparent to his father's cloth business. He really hasn't broken from that yet. He's in his early 20s, he's learning the trade, and yet at the same time you have these rather offbeat aspects to his life, one of which was, a, this is just a kind of a representative uh, story, 
On one occasion, he was walking down the street in Assisi, and there was a guy sitting there begging. And like a typical uh, beggar, you know, I think he had a, 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 a kind of a cardboard thing that said, you know, we'll work for food. Like I used, when I practiced law, I always had this thing, we'll practice law for food, we'll sue for food, you know, that was that sort of thing. And uh, that's what Francis uh, uh, bumped into there. He had this character and he just was moved by the appearance of the guy. His clothing was so poor and rough, he was just the picture of a guy in desperate need and somehow it, it just moved Francis at the moment to swap clothes with him. And he walked over and said to the man, he didn't have any money on him, but he would give him all of his clothing in exchange for the clothing the beggar was wearing. The man was astonished but didn't argue, and so, of course, Francis is wearing this very nice, you know, high-quality clothing, gives it to the beggar. The beggar's clothing is smelly, you know, torn, awful, and repulsive, really, and Francis puts it on and walks away in the beggar's garments. And it did seem to have quite an impact on both of those men at that moment. And that's the kind of thing you see, a little over the top, to be sure, but really driven by some kind of heartfelt and highly engaging sense of a call to such people. There was another occasion that's uh, better known in Francis' life from this time in his life, he was always very much re, uh, felt a certain degree of loathing and repulsion toward people who had leprosy. There was a leper colony just not far outside of Assisi, and these people were largely quarantined, almost in a biblical sense, you know, kind of like the unclean sort of thing. And Francis was always very, very um, uh, just, just horrified, really, by the sight of it. He wanted to get away from it. He was terrified, really of this disease of leprosy. It wasn't well understood, obviously, in those days. And, and, uh, but Francis now also was feeling the, the consci conscience in connection with that. And on one occasion, there's this remarkable story in which he sees a person on the outskirts of town with leprosy. And he's, he feels this kind of recoiling from that person. But something else, more or less, captures him at the same moment. And almost in an act of sheer will to overcome this, this what he felt was a, was a very uh, despicable attitude in himself. He walks over to the man, embraces him, kisses him on the lips, you know, just to kind of break through this repulsion that he felt. That's the sort of thing that we find in Francis. Maybe one of the most controversial but, de but defining moments with Francis took place in connection with something called the San Damiano Chapel. This, I tried to find a picture of it, and I couldn't, but it was a little chapel just outside of Assisi, and it was a lovely place in a lovely setting, but it was a chapel that had fallen into a fair amount of disrepair, and Francis liked to go there and pray and reflect on things at that location, but as he was there one day, he just was looking at it and realizing that it had become quite dilapidated. Uh, it was really in a state of some uh, modest ruin, really. It wasn't being cared for, and it wasn't in great shape. And he felt that something just said to him, this place needed to be refurbished. And Francis felt that he himself was being called to do this, to just kind of rehabilitate this little chapel. He didn't have the money to do it, but he came up with a very bright idea. See what you think of this idea. He went to his father's clo cloth store, stole some cloth, went out, sold it, and used the money to hire some workers to go to work on the San Damiano Chapel. Good plan? Dad didn't think so. Uh, and this was a major kind of rift in the family relationship. Here's the man who was supposed to be taking over this business eventually, who is now, you know, in what has to be called, a, you know, a, maybe a misguided, whatever it was, I'll let you assess it ethically on your own, but, but nevertheless, that's what happened. And the father just flew into a rage, was, was just, you know, lost it completely. He was already pretty unhappy with Francis. Francis was not kind of walking down the path that his father had hoped for, was being a little weird, was having this preoccupation with the poor, and, uh, you know, you can just imagine in a businessman's mind, what's, what's up with my son, you know, this kind of thing. And this was just, this was the final straw. And he actually had Francis arrested. And he had him, he actually had a, a thrown into what was a, amounted to a prison in his own home. <laughs> 
and he was uh, incarcerated there for some time, like uh, two or three months, and the father is just fuming all this time, what am I going to do with this son of mine? The mother was a little bit more of a soft-hearted person and eventually engineered Francis escaping, but nevertheless, the trial against Francis proceeded. And there was an open public trial in which the father was suing the son to recover the losses from this cloth that had been sold. And uh, of course, Francis put up no defense. He didn't have any particular defense to uh, offer at that point. And so when he lost the case, Francis very famously, this may be one of the most famous incidents in the life of Francis, he stripped off his clothes and he abandoned every earthly possession that he had to his father and said, okay, you win, it's all yours, and Francis walked out of the life of his father, and as far as I know, there was never any healing of that rift, so it's a very unhappy uh, moment in his life, but this was kind of the big difference that was uh, characterizing the direction of Francis from that of his father. So from that point on, he adopted the life of what was called a penitent beggar. He became a kind of beggar around town wearing the same clothing as one, but rather than simply begging, it was sort of a style of life that you would find among some in the religious orders in which they were also trying to establish a paradigm for prayer and for religious discipline and so on. And so their begging was not just begging, it was more than that. We would look at it and might wonder, you know, if that was really a real healthy way to approach the Christian uh, you know, disciplines, but well, I'll leave that to, to your own consideration. But that was kind of the uh, approach that he took at that point. He was still in Assisi. He was still well known. But at this point, he is now being treated to a high degree of mockery and jeering, kind of like Peter Waldo we talked about last week. He's kind of flipped over to the other side, and people don't know what to make of it, and they just, he becomes the, you know, the punchline to any number of jokes, as you can probably imagine, around town, and people are really just giving him a bad time, and he's not getting much uh, respect for this, but he does believe that this is what God is calling him to do. So this little, in, this little moment lasts about a year or so, uh, takes place at this time. This is really what runs up to the establishment of the Franciscan order, which took place officially in 1209. He was uh, attending church, of course, regularly. On one occasion, uh, as I was indicating to you earlier, he was in church and he heard a sermon on this text from Matthew chapter 9. And the text, of course, is highlighting the career of Jesus and establishing a kind of ethic by which we should live. But the verse that really grabbed Francis and really never left him, I'd say for the rest of his life, he kept coming back to this. Not that he was trying to universalize it. This wasn't uh, you know, Kant's categorical imperative where you can universalize his rule, everybody should do this. This wasn't uh, what Francis was doing, but he did fully believe that God had somehow impressed into his own conscience that this was what he was to do. And indeed, this is precisely what he did do. And it was uh, captured in these words, uh, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts nor bag for your journey nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. And Francis kind of formed a vision at this point in his mind that he was to go out, sort of like these disciples that Jesus sent out, living off of local hospitality, but diverting all that came to him back into caring for, helping, and watching over and providing some relief for those who were in the most desperate need uh, that he would come across in life. This gave rise to a whole new notion of being a monk. Now, he wasn't a monk yet, but, but his vision was a little different from what had been the standard paradigm. Up until this time, if you were a monk, uh, a monk, you lived in a monastery, you know, and it was kind of a cloistered life, and people would come to you with their needs. If they were sick, if they were hungry, if they had other needs, then they would go to the monastery. And the monastery was sort of like the center of all these social services that were available at that time in history. Francis' vision was just the opposite. Leave the monastery, go out into the streets, go out into the highways and byways, hunt down these people who are in need and trust God to make provision so that you can help and meet those needs, even those people who don't even know how to find a monastery or have the energy to do so. So it gives rise to the kind of friar approach, the sort of mendicant monk who's out there traveling around, 
uh, many times just walking barefoot, rough clothes, but nevertheless looking for opportunities to serve. And that was really this new vision that we find developing. And it came from this. This was the verse that kind of set the agenda, you might say, for Francis' own view of his own call. At that time, there were 11 others that joined him, mostly from that region, mostly from Assisi. And so he becomes a little band of 12 at this time, and they call themselves the Lesser Brothers. They call themselves Lesser Brothers because the term brother was typically applied to people who were monks. And at this point, Francis is not an official monk or any sort of official sanction of the church whatsoever, and so he just simply calls himself lesser brothers, you know, uh, less than brothers, but nevertheless out there, hopefully looking for opportunities to serve. And he began to try to develop the, uh, you might say, the uh, mechanisms of helping folks, and he, he's a beggar for sure. But he, you know, part of what he's doing is saying, you're not just giving to me, you're giving to this ministry. And so he would appeal to people to give in order that he, in turn, could have resources to help others. He was especially, deeply, all of his career, touched by and moved by this disease of leprosy. Uh, we obviously have a little better understanding of the disease today, at least some of you MDs out there do, than, than uh, maybe we did way back then. But at this point, it was still viewed almost as uh, in, the, in the biblical category, something unclean, something to be more or less uh, uh, set aside and pushed off into unseen places, leper colonies, that sort of thing. And uh, Francis wanted to do something about it. It was really in some ways responding to his own sense of, of uh, being um, sort of repulsed by it. And so he would gather especially food, medication, clothing, and other sorts of helps for these people who lived in this leper colony that wasn't too far from Assisi, and others as well. So this was kind of his defining uh, agenda at that point. In 1210, which was now three years after the incident with his father, he went to the church in Rome, remember he's in Assisi, it's not that far, and seeks to have an audience with the Pope. The Pope was pretty busy these days. He had wars he was fighting, cru crusades he was managing, you know, and so the Pope didn't really have a whole lot of time for a guy like Francis who didn't appear, I mean, let's face it, the Pope had never heard of St. Francis of Assisi. Let's just, you know, and so he didn't know who this guy was, and he comes in looking like a beggar, and he's got a couple other guys with him that didn't look much better, and the Pope probably spent five minutes with him and decided, you know, uh, go get a job. You know, that was kind of the, the Pope's response. And uh, so he was pretty well rebuffed on that initial at opportunity or uh, attempt to get some kind of recognition, official recognition from the church. There's a very famous story that took place, and I assume there's some truth to it. This is a little fresco that was created by the Renaissance, the early Renaissance painter Giotto, in which he's celebrating this very kind of well-known moment which took place in the career of the Pope that night. He went to bed, and, uh, and as he's uh, is sleeping there in the middle of the night, he has this, this disturbing dream. And in the dream, he sees this, this beggar who had just been in his presence the, the day before, but in the dream he sees him, as Giotto pictures it there, holding up the entire church on one shoulder. Do you see that? Is that clear enough? And so the picture that the Pope has is of Francis, this beggar, being kind of like a pillar that's upholding the entire edifice of the church. And the Pope decides, wow, maybe I underestimated this guy. And so the next day he sends out and, and hunts down Francis, who's still in town, brings him back, and indeed gives him, based on this vision that he had had, uh, a, a, the blessing of the church. Uh, and so at this point, uh, Francis becomes an official, or at least is able to establish an official order of monks. The only thing the Pope really required of him was that he uh, tonsor his hair, you know, where they kind of shave the little middle part so he looks like a monk, and... And uh, so that's what he does, and that's why images you see of Francis from that point on reflect that kind of monkish appearance. So that launches really then the so-called Franciscan mission. This continues from 1210 until the death of Francis, which was only 16 years later. He died a relatively young man, 46 years old, and yet, uh, and many people would say he just w burned himself out in his labors, 
day and night pouring himself into the lives of people that were in such desperate need in those days. He was for real. He was a man who really did devote himself in a powerful way to this kind of evident human need. From that point on, from the moment that the Pope really sanctioned the Franciscan order, uh, there was rapid growth. By the time that Francis died, there were something like 5,000 Franciscans, and it just kept growing exponentially over the years from there. These people traveled around the world. They traveled on foot in all quarters, Islamic parts of the world as well as Christian, north, south. They just went out the far four points of the compass, and, and Francis himself did a fair amount of traveling uh, during his re relatively brief uh, career. There was a woman in Assisi named Claire, who in a sense was kind of like the female version of Francis. And as early as 1211, she thought she would very much like to do something like what Francis was doing with an order of women, of nuns really, who would follow a similar design. And so actually, Francis was involved in helping her of uh, st establishing this order of nuns that came to be called the Poor Clares, which are also with us, as you may know, to this day. And so those two kind of share a common root in history coming out of the influence of Francis. Uh, Francis traveled through uh, parts of the Islamic world. He was on one occasion in Egypt. This is probably the most famous confrontation, uh, maybe not the best word, it was a, a, certainly a, an opportunity for Francis to speak with the Sultan of Egypt, whose name was al Kamil, And Francis gave him a very Christian message, and the man was very deeply touched by it. To our knowledge, he didn't convert to the Christian faith, I don't think there's any evidence of that, but he was moved profoundly by the simplicity and the elegance and the virtue and the humility and integrity of this man Francis and essentially gave him free reign in, in Egypt as long as he wanted to stay, to be provided for, to carry on his ministry. And so it was one of those moments when right in the middle of the Crusades, when there, was, there were other people fighting and shedding blood not that far away here, Francis, just on the pure power of his own, uh, the grace that was at work in his life, was able to kind of work right past all of that and really have quite an impact there uh, for some time in Egypt. Francis is the first guy that we know of in history to set up a nativity scene. So if you like to set up a little uh, nativity scene on, at Christmas time, you can thank Francis. He invented it, you know. Uh, based on the biblical descriptions of the birth of Christ, he, in order to be pedagogical, actually set up a little nativity and used it to, to teach that uh, Christ, though he was a king, he was uh, incalculable royalty of heaven and earth, nevertheless condescended to be born in a barn, born in the smells of a stable, laid in a feed trough, and all of this Francis used to try to highlight that we sometimes get preoccupied with the wrong things and we need to be a little bit more appreciative of the designs that come from Christ himself. He sent his followers into all parts of the world as we indicated a moment ago. He's well known for a variety of things that are almost a little bit humorous and again I'm just having to be very selective here but one of my favorites is his so-called Sermon to the Birds. There is very solid testimony that wherever Francis went, birds and I don't mean pigeons now, you know. Birds followed him. Pigeons probably did too, but it was like nice birds, you know. And they would just kind of hover around him. And, and there does seem to be some pretty good documentation that if Francis would just hold his arm out, birds would land on his arm, you know, little goldfinches and that kind of stuff. I don't know, I've tried that. They don't like me very much, but somehow Francis had the rapport. And on one occasion, there is uh, testimony that as he was walking along and he had these kind of birds and other wildlife sort of, you know, out there, and the, that Francis turned aside into a little meadow and actually gave a sermon to the birds, you know. And uh, so the, it comes in various forms. This is a pretty well uh, accepted version of it. Uh, they all are more or less similar. So, uh, my little sisters, Francis said, the birds, much bounden are you unto God, your creator. And always in every place ought ye to praise him, for that he hath given you liberty to fly about everywhere, and hath also given you double and triple raiment. Moreover, he preserved your seed in the ark of Noah, that your race might not perish out of the world. 
Still more are you beholden to him for the element of the air which he has appointed for you. Beyond all this you sow not, neither do you reap, and God feeds you and gives you the streams and fountains for your drink, the mountains and valleys for your refuge, and the high trees whereon you make your nests. And because you know not how to spin or sow, God clothes you and your children, wherefore your Creator loves you much, seeing that he hath bestowed on you so many benefits. And therefore, my little sisters, beware of the sin of ingratitude, and study always to give praises unto God. So, Francis' sermon to the birds. I don't know if the birds took it to heart, but I think there were some people standing around eavesdropping who probably got the message, and so Francis used that. I would be remiss if I didn't, of course, remind us all, probably the best known literature that is traced to Francis is this well-known prayer of his, uh, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And those remarkable words, of course, have come down to us as some of the richest and most beloved words of any saint of the church that have ever been penned, and obviously you've all heard that, but that's one of the better known expressions. Francis not only had an impact, he died, as I say, at the age of 46, and he just died of broken health. He gave himself so fully in his ministry that it seems burning, you know, at both ends, the, the candle at both ends, he just basically wore out, and he is uh, credited with having that strange phenomenon known as the stigmata, if you're familiar with that, and there may be some truth to that. But in any event, his impact carried on well beyond his career. And I'd like to, in the brief time we have left, highlight one other story here that's more or less connected to Francis, but is much less well known. And this is a young woman by the name of Elizabeth of Hungary. Be brave. Anybody ever heard of Elizabeth of Hungary? Is this brand new to, have you? Okay, excellent, all right. She's the good one. She's good. She is a contemporary of Francis. So just, just a little bit of a, a story on her because their lives did intersect uh, to some degree. She was born of Andrew II of Hungary. Hungary was established as a kingdom in about the year 1000. If you recall, the, the founding of the Holy Roman Empire was by, it was first of all, Henry the Fowler, who was famous because he'd fought off the Huns. Remember that? They were invading from the east, and they were pretty vicious and pretty warlike. But there was, about the year 1000, once again, for whatever reasons, a lot of the barbarians just kind of settled down. And this region, known as Hungary, was established about then. So this isn't a great map, but you can see it's off to the east, of the Holy Roman Empire, and it was established about the year 1000, and now we're 200 years or so later, the Christian influence had become very deeply insinuated into this uh, region of Europe, and so this was a Christian region by now, 200 years later. Andrew himself, who's, uh, this is a statue of him, had been deeply touched by Francis. Francis actually traveled through Hungary, and he was moved deeply by the message of Francis, and though he was a king, wanted in some way or other to incorporate into his own life and conscience some of the great values that he saw. Elizabeth was born in 1207, the same year that Francis had his rift with his father, so she's a newborn at that point. And under the influence of Christian training generally, and Francis and other uh, sorts of forces at work, she was given a deeply Christian education in her early years. When she was 14 years old, which is a little young to get married in my opinion, but in 14 years old, she was married 
to the man who was called the Landgrave of Thuringia, which was part of the Holy Roman Empire. It was one of the major provinces of the Holy Roman Empire, and the man who was the uh, ruler of that region, kind of the nobleman who ruled over it, was a man named Louis the, or Louis the Fourth, the Fourth. And so she marries him at uh, the age of 14 and lives here at Wartburg Castle. You may recognize Wartburg Castle plays in church history again some years later uh, in the life of, anybody recognize that? Who's, anybody know? Martin Luther actually hid out here for about a year after the Diet of Worms. So we'll, we'll see this place again. But at this point, it is the, uh, the abode of the ruling family of Thuringia. So that's where she's living. And from 1221 to 1226, she's only a teenager, as you know, she's the wife of Louis IV, but she became very well known in this region. I mean, kind of famous, like, uh, you know, a pop star quality here, not because she was showy, but just the opposite. She was just known for her deep humility and beauty of heart. She was a beautiful woman, for sure, but, but more than that, she was beautiful in her countenance, in her concern, and she had really been touched herself by Francis and by his concern for the poor, and she had done a great deal to try to reach out and provide for those who were in need. Her husband was frequently out of town on political business and so on, and, and she was well known for, when he was out of town, dressing in very simple clothing, almost like a peasant herself. And she would go out and distribute food and help and provide in any way that she could. Here was royalty who wasn't parading it at all. When her husband came home, she'd always dress up in her finest stuff, you know. She, and when asked about it, she said she didn't want to give her husband any reason to complain about her, you know, so she wanted to be beautiful when he was in town, when he was out of town, she was just down there on the street doing what she could. But there was an extraordinary incident that took place in 1226, a ravaging famine swept through a great deal of that region and Thuringia was especially hard hit. Her husband was out of town at the time and she was feeling desperately the need to do something for the uh, these people who in many cases were on death's door from starvation and and so she made an official decision without her husband's permission to open the castle granaries and provide uh, she sold some of the assets off to get uh, funds whatever she could importing from wherever she could food and help and so on for these people the bureaucrats running the administration were apoplectic she thought you know they thought what is this you know 18 year old girl know about running a state and but she had the authority in her husband's absence and she made these decisions when Lewis learned of what was going on, that is the famine, he came home as fast as he could to provide whatever help he could, and these bureaucrats go out and they're whining to him, complaining, do you know what that wife of yours is doing? And he just shut them up right there. He said, I absolutely endorse and support what she's doing, and uh, she is acting like a Christian, as you ought to be. She just rebuked them, you see, right on the spot. So his, his uh, support was with her, and Together they fed some 900 people a day at the uh, kind of a soup kitchen kind of thing and provided uh, for uh, those needs. Well, in 1227, Lewis had, uh, went off on a crusade and he died on the way. So this husband of hers, who she really did love, they loved each other, I think that's clear, is all of a sudden out of the picture and rule devolves to Lewis's brother, Henry, who's a bad guy. And he immediately, uh, because he now has the authority to do, or do so, cuts off Elizabeth, essentially drives her out, literally in the middle of the winter, pushes her out the door with her three kids, and they go from being royalty to being on the street themselves. She went into the city, where, which was not far from the castle, hoping to find refuge with someone. And the very people that she had served so faithfully in fear of threats by Henry closed their doors on her. And so finally she winds up with her three kids really in, a, in this kind of highly uh, uh, you know, distressed state, winds up sleeping literally in a stable. An innkeeper gave her a, a place to sleep in a stable. Two or three days later she winds up in a chapel that she herself with her husband had built a Franciscan chapel, and that's where she lived for some years. And she, uh, in that time, of course, has been uh, deprived of all of her 
uh, wealth and all of her prestige, but even in this time, it's well documented, she's still, in the very Franciscan kind of state of mind, devoted herself as much as she could, as much in need as she was, to the needs of others. And so these were years of uh, service. Uh, she would beg for her children, uh, she, to, for food for them. She would sleep in the church. But even when she was living off the meagerly income of a beggar, she would take a little portion of it, some 10% or so, and give it away and help of others. That was kind of the ethic by which she lived. She finally got a job, uh, and this is one of the most famous images of Elizabeth of Hungary. She became a spinner of wool. And so this was how she eked out a living during these years, and even the product that she produced in these times was in many ways devoted to the needs of the poor. Some of the knights who were there in Thuringia, when it, when it dawned on them what, uh, what Henry had done, became enraged. This was some months later, and they stormed uh, Henry and said he must give her some of the estate that was rightfully hers from the death of her husband. And Henry, under that kind of pressure, gave her a small estate, a small portion. So she once again had a little bit of resources. This was probably about eight or nine months later. She took the resources that she received from Henry under, that, uh, under the duress there and built a hospital. I'm, uh, I'm ahead of myself, and, and built a hospital uh, there in that region and used the resources that were available to her to provide whatever medications they could, whatever food and warmth and blankets. She used none of it really for herself, but was again devoting herself completely to the needs of others. There's a, uh, an incident where her father, who was unaware of most of this, it happened rather rapidly, learned that his daughter, this is the king of Hungary now, learned that his daughter had been reduced to this abject poverty, and he sent high-level ambassadors to go and rescue her and bring her home. And he was preparing, actually, to make war against Thuringia out of his outrage that his daughter should be treated this way when she was, in fact, royalty. The ambassador showed up, had to look around through the town, finally found Elizabeth in this little dark hovel. There she is. She's and, and the ambassador, as soon as he saw her, burst into tears. He recognized her. This is Princess Elizabeth. He went and fell on his knees in front of her and clasped her hand and said, thank God I found you. And he, he assumes that he can now rescue her and take her home and put her back into the circumstances that are befitting someone who's nobility and royalty indeed, you know. And, and this is going to be all it takes for the king of Hungary to just come in there and, and really teach these guys a lesson. And Elizabeth stopped him. She said she was not going to go home with him. God had called her to this ministry, and she was going to stay here. She appreciated it. Give my love to my father, but this is, I'm, a, I'm serving a greater king than my father, was what she said. And she determined to stay there and continued to do so. Uh, and she died about three years later, uh, essentially just of broken health in devoting herself to this. These are the kinds of stories that populate church history, you know, and sometimes we, we think we're the people that invented the Christian faith. I think sometimes we're the people that forgot the Christian faith, that uh, you look at some of these lives that uh, really peppered down through the history of God's people, and, and so many of them are unsung, unknown to us, uh, but how uh, inspiring it is to us to know that there are Elizabeths of Hungary, and she of course, inspired by Francis, and Francis inspired by the scriptures, and how many others down through history have been wonderful examples of embodying and making personal the very heart of the gospel in such a way. So anyway, uh, Elizabeth of Hungary, really a remarkable uh, woman who is used by God. Just a closing thought here. This text that was so powerful for Francis, take no gold or silver or copper, no bag for your money. The state of mind that Francis had was God will provide, and he believed God was calling him distinctively to this kind of mission. I don't think, as I said earlier, Francis would say that you're not a real Christian unless you do exactly the same thing. He understood that if you're going to be out on the street begging for help, you've got to have some people that are actually doing the work to give to a beggar. You know, he understood that. He was smart enough to know that there's there's more to the kingdom of God than just following that paradigm. But in some way or other, that still is the heart of the matter. 
that even we who might not be out in that particular mode externally need to be in something of that mode internally, realizing that God has entrusted to us those things that are within the purview of our administration. We are not owners, we are managers. God has given us this, and he's given us this, whatever it is, whether it's plenty or want or whatever the circumstance is, God has given it to us for the purpose of being his servants and building his kingdom in the way that he's called us to. And so whether or not we follow precisely the paradigm here, there's certainly something of it that we can follow rather precisely in our hearts. And I think that's the lesson we can learn from someone like Francis and someone like Elizabeth and many others who take that sort of radical approach to life, is that there is a radicality about Christian living and Christian discipline which embraces this principle, at least at the heart of the matter, uh, whatever station in life God may call us to. Mm-hmm.